coming up on Extra Credit, we make paper rockets, meet an engineer who helps people explore outer space, and remember the life of an amazing woman known as the human computer. Stay tuned. This program is made possible in part by Michigan Department of Education, the state of Michigan, and by viewers like you. to Extra Credit, where we meet interesting people, explore new ideas, and discover fun places together. Each episode will introduce you to people who use math, science, sports, and writing to make the world an interesting place. My name is Mrs. Pizzo, and I'm delighted to meet you. Our theme today is space, but before we head to the moon, let's meet our co-hosts. Hi friends, my name is Saryu and I'm so happy to spend this time with you. Have you ever thought about what it would be like to go into space? I definitely have. Do you know that there are some people who knew they wanted to explore space even when they were little kids? Let's start by hearing about one such kid, Ron McNair, who later became a physicist and was the second African American to enter space. When he was nine years old, Ron, without my parents or myself knowing his whereabouts, he decided to take a mile walk from our home down to the library, which was, of course, public library, but not so public for black folks okay. when you're talking about 1959. So as he was walking in there, all these folks were staring at him because they were white folk only, and they were looking at him and saying, well, you know, who is this Negro? <laughs> so he politely positioned himself in line to check out his books. Well, this old librarian, she says, this library is not for coloreds. He said, well, I would like to check out these books. She says, young man, if you don't leave this library right now, I'm going to call the police. So he just propped himself up on the counter <laughs> and, <laughs> and sat there and said, I'll wait. So she called the police and subsequently called my mother. Police came down, two burly guys come in and say, well, where's the disturbance? And she pointed to this little nine-year-old boy sitting up on the counter. He says, man, what's the problem? <laughs> so my mother, in the meanwhile, she was called. She comes down there praying the whole way there. Lord, Jesus, please don't let them put my child in jail. And my mother asked the librarian, what's the problem? Well, he wanted to check out the books. And you know your son shouldn't be down here. And the police officer said, you know, why don't you just give the kid the books? And my mother said, he'll take good care of them. And reluctantly, the librarian gave Ron the books. And my mother said, what did you say? He said, thank you, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> Later on, as youngsters, a show came on TV called Star Trek. Now, Star Trek showed the future where there were black folk and white folk working together. Right. And I looked at it as science fiction because that wasn't going to happen, really. But Ronald saw it as science possibility. Mm -hmm. You know, he came up during a time when there was Neil Armstrong and all of those guys so how was a, a colored boy from South Carolina wearing glasses, never flew a plane, how was he going to become an astronaut? But Ron was the one who didn't accept societal norms as being his norm. I mean, that was for other people. And uh, he got to be aboard his own Starship Enterprise.
Here on Earth, we can use sunscreen to help protect ourselves from the sun's UV radiation. In space, there's no atmosphere to filter out the worst of it. So you'd think astronauts would fly around with an extra rocket full of SPF 50 to protect themselves. But it turns out, UV is the least of their worries. If we ever want to get to Mars, we're going to need more than a tube of coconut scented grease. There is UV radiation in space. The sun puts out radiation along pretty much the entire electromagnetic spectrum, from radio waves to gamma rays. Starting around UV, electromagnetic radiation has the potential to strip electrons away from molecules and cause chemical havoc. If UV light hits a piece of DNA, that DNA molecule can break and cause mutations in our cells that can lead to skin cancer. Earth's ozone layer stops the most dangerous UV radiation, but some less dangerous but still kinda dangerous UV can still get through, and that's why we need sunscreen. In space, there's much less atmosphere, so you would think that astronauts would slather on the screen, but they don't, because spaceships and spacesuits are built out of stuff that stops UV radiation. So theoretically, there's more than enough UV in space to give you the worst sunburn of your life ever, but that's the least of your worries. The real worry for astronauts isn't UV radiation, but high energy subatomic particles, plus stuff like gamma rays. The sun gives off both electromagnetic radiation and those high energy particles, like protons, electrons, and alpha particles. Then there is the risk of, and we are not joking, atomic nuclei from stars that exploded a million years ago. These supernova remnants are called galactic cosmic radiation, and they're mostly protons and alpha particles, plus a smattering of heavier particles, tearing through space at nearly the speed of light. Don't worry about what all these things are, there is no quiz and no homework assignment at the end of this episode. They're just small things moving very, very destructively fast. And anything moving at such incredible speeds has a lot of energy and a lot of potential to break whatever it hits. That could be an unfortunate astronaut, but it's more likely to be the wall of a spacecraft, at which point some of those atoms could break apart and produce secondary radiation more protons and alpha particles, or gamma rays, that might hurt the astronauts inside. Here at home, we really don't have to worry about this kind of space radiation. Far beyond the ozone layer, Earth has another radiation shield, our magnetic field. And those space particles can be deflected by a magnetic field. And the fact that our planet is a giant magnet comes in real handy when it comes to bashing most of those particles right back out into space. Fortunately, although astronauts in Earth orbit, like on the International Space Station, fly above our atmospheric UV shield, most of the time they're still low enough to be protected by our giant magnetic umbrella. The risk is to astronauts who leave the protective confines of our magnetic field, say to the Moon or Mars. A round-trip flight to Mars, plus a nice year and a half stay, carries with it a radiation exposure equivalent to a roughly 5.5% increase in the risk of developing a fatal cancer. So any ship that travels outside of the Earth's magnetic field, including to Mars, would need extra shielding to deal with space radiation. The best way to block protons and alpha particles is with something of a similar size. That means that hydrogen, whose nucleus is really just a proton, actually makes a very good shield against high energy space particles. That's true even though it's the smallest element. And that's good news for space travel, because hydrogen is really lightweight, and we'd have to take lots of it to space anyway, like in the water that astronauts will need to, like, live and stuff. The sun produces radiation all the time, but space also has weather of a sort. Solar flares and other events can cause radiation storms that astronauts would need to shelter from. So one proposed idea is to build a sort of bunker hidden beneath the ship's water supply to hide in if a solar flare causes a radiation storm. Plastics also contain a lot of hydrogen, so believe it or not, a plastic shield is a very viable way to deal with potential radiation. But any kind of physical shielding, even nice lightweight plastic, increases the weight of the spacecraft and the difficulty of launching it into space in the first place. So engineers are also interested in developing a mini-magnetic field, just like the Earth-generated one that protects us which would basically be a force field, which would be sci-fi as heck and really, really cool. But current technology requires a huge, heavy power source to generate a strong enough field, so it's right back around to the weight problem. Radiation is just one of the many huge hurdles we'll have to get over if we ever want to go to Mars. NASA and other space agencies do care about the safety of their astronauts. Plus, if interplanetary travel ever becomes a thing, and I will be first in line if it ever becomes a thing, the rest of us will want to be safe as well. Evidently, NASA hasn't considered that extra payload full of sunscreen, so we'll let them have that one for free.
I work in NASA Ames and I'm a space human factors engineer there. And what that means is that I build tools and systems to help people make space operations possible. Internships and summer programs are really, really important for uh, girls and women. Um, I know that the reason I work in NASA is because I had the opportunity to work in NASA one summer. And because I did that, I was able to understand what NASA is about, its mission, the kind of work I would be doing. Um, and I got the contacts that I needed so that when I finished school and, and college and um, grad school, I was able to talk to these people and find a job in NASA. Girls should become engineers because we need girls. We need them to bring their creativity, bring their thoughts and their curiosity to the problem um, because they can do it just as well as I can and anybody else can. I've been very fortunate to work in a lot of exciting projects and as someone who is a bona fide space nerd, um, having the opportunity to experience all these things has been really, really amazing. I've done everything from um, using the, the same shuttle trainer um, as astronauts and learning about how they train. I've been as lucky as being able to fly in the parabolic uh, flight where you can experience microgravity. Um, but I think one of the coolest things that I've done is going to these analog field tests. So analog field tests are places around Earth that simulate some part of space exploration. Um, so one time I got to go up to the Arctic and really explore and understand how scientists would explore an area kind of like Mars. Um, and uh, next week, I'm actually flying down to Florida because there's another Earth analog where the astronauts are living in a habitat underwater for two weeks. And they are simulating all different aspects of being in a mission and exploring another planet, um, being on time delay. You can't even talk to them real time. Um, and so those kinds of experiences have really kept me motivated and excited about being in the human space flight program.
It's that time again, friends. I just received word that Dr. Blotch is gonna check in with us to see how we're doing with our writing challenge. It involves creating comics. Are you ready? Dr. Blatch. <laughs> okay. I'm totally here, Dr. Blatch. Um, and so are you. How's it going? What's up? Uh, great, except I'm hungry for more stories via comics. Oh, well, I mean, I'm working on it. Me? Yeah, that's exactly what I'm working on right now. It's funny that this is when you would pop in. Let me see. Let me see. Okay. You know, it's not done. Because I thought I had a little more time, but... You do have more time, but I, I'm anxious to see what you're working on, Courtney. May I please see your draft? I'm going to risk showing you this outline for my next page. Here it is. Hmm. Hmm. Yes, yes. Yes, pictures. Yes. I see. Well, it seems like Sparkles is excited. Her triceratops eyes are, are hey. rather smooth and large right now. Her pupils are dilated. Uh, yes, I like the little score marks that you've shown to indicate hey. motion. Um, well, let's see. But by the time I get to the third panel you've drawn, hmm. I'm getting a little bored of Sparkle's excited face. I don't want her to not be excited, but isn't there some problem? Hmm. You, 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 you have to have a problem in a story, right? You have to have okay. something that can be solved. You know, you're right. I totally forgot about that part. I got really excited, you know, hence probably why Sparkles is so excited. I was really interested in drawing the picture, so I forgot to give her something to kind of overcome. Well... I can't blame you for that, because what is art except for an escape? Uh, I can't blame you for not thinking <laughs> of problems, but, um, you know, you can draw from perhaps. What if she's too excited? How would, be, how, would, how would being too excited get in the way of her work and her relationships? I don't know, Courtney. You'll come up with something. Hmm. You, look at me being inspired by Dr. Blotch. I'm totally going to do my best. I'm on it. Okay, so here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna do an activity and the activity is called Impact Cratering. And what that means is that we're going to pretend that we're creating a um, craters on the moon from meteorites hitting them, okay? We need a pan and some flour. The flour and we need that. We're gonna use some crab boil. And we're gonna do this because we want we want it to be cool when we have our meteorites hit the landscape, okay? Hit the the moonscape. Gotta have a lot of layers of stuff. So as you can see, guys, um, my mom is is pouring, and I am shaking. That's good. Now the next ingredient is, is the. Let's do some cornmeal. Here, put that on. Ooh. Okay, that's good. Yeah. That's good. Now we just want to layer it over top. You don't have to shake it. But what you want to do is you want to show people what it looks like. So lift it up so just a little bit. So this is what it looks like. Good. Yeah. We keep a lot of seasoning in our house. Yeah. We want to make things, we want to use things that have well, like many way. different colors. Let's put a little bit of this baking soda over the top of it. I really don't want to part with this, but it's oh. it's my coffee. I'm going to put a little coffee on top of it too. Oh, yo. 
Here comes the fun part. Are you ready? Oh yeah, wait for the meat to show up. <laughs> so, before we get into the media show, you have to understand the reason why, what we're going to be looking for. One of the things that we learned when we went to the moon first time was we learned that some of the craters have high ridges on the side. Some of them have deep centers and they have a name for all of these different things. So we are going to be looking for four things. We're going to be looking for the floor. We're going to be looking for rays. We'll be looking for the ejecta. And you know what that is? That's the stuff that pops out and then lands on the other part of the surface. And we'll be looking for the wall. One little tip. We are going to be using a long cardboard tube when we create, when we do our craters. This is gonna, these are going to be our pretend meteoroids. And it's a meteoroid until it hits the surface. Then it becomes a meteorite. Wow, so see. Cool. Now we're going to use the small impactors. One regular speed, one slow motion going to use the medium size impact. So guys, we have a big marble. It does even a big impactor. It does even fit in this thing. Look. Look how big that is. So we're just going to drop it. Hey guys, we are back and my experiment explode. Your experiment exploded your mind? Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's show everybody what we ended up with. We're looking for the floor of a crater, we're looking for ejecta, we're looking for the wall, and we are looking for the rays, the rays, okay? So we're gonna carefully take the impactors out. So let's identify some pieces now. We've got the floor. And then we've got like um, the wall. Can you tell me where the wall is on that one? Um, right there. Very good, sir. We are looking for the, the rays. rays. Now, I saw rays when we did the first one, when we did the first impactor. And then finally, the ejecta. That's like all of the stuff that ended up everywhere outside of the pan and on top of everything else. Like, see, so. We have a lot of ejecta on the floor. Mm -hmm. Thank you, NASA, for making me do this project. I really liked it. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Welcome to Impact at Home, where we practice interrupting prolonged sitting with activity. I am Melanie Rapelli, and this is my brother, Justin Strickland, and my friend, Landon. And we are here to help you get moving for the next eight minutes. You'll be surprised at what these moments of movement can do for you and for the rest of your family, so you can stay active and healthy at home. So go ahead, get up, and let's start moving. For this movement activity, we're going to be doing a HIIT workout. You do not need anything for this, but if you would like a mat, that would work for one of the exercises or the carpet is totally fine. Let's go ahead and get warmed up, start jogging in place. Get our heart rate up before we jump into our workout. Justin here will be doing the advanced version, so follow him if you'd like more of a challenge. And Landon will be doing the modified version if something is too difficult for you. Go ahead and follow him. All right, we're switching to jumping jacks. And our heart rate up. Nice job. And squat jump. Squat, touch the floor, jump up. Make sure you're leaning back on your heels. 
Nice job. Don't let your knees go over your toes. All right, and switching to walk out arm circles. So walking your arms out, back in, and arm circle. Go ahead and do it again. Walk your arms out, arms back in, and an arm circle. Nice work, again, last one. Walking out, walking in, and arm circle. All right, jumping into the first exercise, we have candlestick roll star jumps. Landon, go ahead and show the modified version. Justin will be doing the advanced version. Here we go. Toes up. Nice, and we're jumping. Justin without his hands, toes up, and he's doing a star jump. All right, Landon, keep going. Nice job. Keep moving. Nice job at home. We're jumping, Justin's going. All right, good work, keep going. His arms are up and he's doing a star jump. Good work, one more. Nice job, just get your toes as high as you can. Last one, arms are up, toes up and star jump. Good work, all right, we're resting. March it out, stretch if you need to. Next one will be elbow hand plank. Again, follow Justin for the advanced version. Landed for the modified version if you'd like a mat. Go ahead and use the mat. All right, and we're moving. Elbow hand plank. All right, they're doing it on the hard floor. You got it. Nice job. Keep moving. Nice. Justin's doing his hands at the same time. Landon, elbow, elbow, hand, hand. Try not to wiggle too much at home. We're working our triceps, the back of our arms. Nice work, as many as you can. A couple more in there. Nice job. Good work at home. Feel the burn in your triceps. We're working. Good work, last one. All right, and we're resting. Active rest. If you need to jog it out, march it out, stretch, twist. Get ready for the next one. We have crab tricep dip to opposite toe touch. Justin will slide the mat out of the way. I think we are finished with that. Get ready for dips with our elbows. Dip, dip, opposite toe or opposite foot. Dip, dip, opposite foot, opposite foot. So Landon, if you're watching, he has his butt on the floor when he's reaching. If you like a little bit of an easier version, if it gets too difficult, dip, dip, opposite foot, opposite foot, working our triceps and our core. Nice job. Couple more, we're reaching. And last one, dipping and reaching. All right, go ahead and stand up for an active rest. Moving in place, next one will be plank jack, hip to hip touch. So we'll be starting in a plank and then touching each hip down to both sides. All right, here we go. Holding a plank, feet go apart together, touch your hip, touch your hip. If you'd like an easier version, drop down to your elbows, part together, Justin's gonna keep going on his hands. Nice job, keep moving. Good work, staying in that plank. We're engaging our core. Part together, hip to hip. Try to keep your core nice and tight. Good work, Landon. Nice job, Justin. Good work at home. A couple more, we got it. Nice, again, drop to your elbows if it gets too difficult. Good work, last one. All right, we're standing and resting. Active rest. Good work. Next one, we have a pike push-up. Um, if you have a chair, you can put your feet up on a chair if you think you have a lot of shoulder strength. Otherwise, I'd recommend just staying on the floor. Your butt is in the air or your glutes and you are doing a push-up. You are working your deltoids, your shoulder muscles. Nice job, as low as you can go without falling on your head. Please don't fall on your head. Nice job, even if it's a little bend, that's okay. You should feel it in your shoulders. Nice work, Justin. Good work, Landon. Nice job at home. Keep it up. We're almost there. Good work, good work. All right, a few more. Two more. You got it. Dip and dip. Nice job. All right, active rest and we're moving. Good work, good work. All right, for our cool down, we are starting with some arm circles. Go ahead and move your arms backwards. The hard part is finished. We are cooling down. Nice work. Other way, switch. We're swimming.
Keep swimming. <laughs> nice job. All right, go ahead and switch to shoulder stretch. Grab one arm, slight push on your shoulder so you feel a pull. And we're holding. Make sure to breathe. And switch. All right, and switching to tricep stretch overhead. Grab your elbow, slight pull behind your head. And we're holding. And go ahead and switch to the other side. And hold. All right, last one, we're reaching for our toes. As far as you can, if you're reaching here, that's fine. You should feel a pull in your hamstrings in the back of your legs. Try to touch your toes the best you can and hold. Keep holding. Nice job. All right, good work. Nice job at home. We are finished. I hope you enjoyed today's movement break. Impact at Home is a chance to apply the skills you may have learned in your PE class to improve your health. To learn more about the health benefits associated with daily movement, visit impactathome.umich.edu. Now don't forget to fill out your daily log. We will see you again during our next workout. Support for this program is provided by the Michigan Public Health Institute and the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Why do you like space so much? Uh, there's so much sights to see. Nebulas, hot Jupiters, and supernova remnants. Yeah. They look so beautiful. You know how I fell in love with space? My mom gave me a really cool space shuttle. You would wind it back and then... Uh, I have that. You have that. So I remember playing with that all the time and I wanted to become a pilot. I used to fly planes when I was 17 years old. And then after that, I started commanding spacecraft in NASA. Have you ever been to space? I have not, but it's a dream of mine. I want to live on another planet. Another planet? Like, what kind of planet would you live on? Um, of course, everybody's going to say Mars, right? You're going to say Mars? No. Kepler 452b. Oh, yeah. So Kepler 452b is your favorite planet. You know what we call those? Exoplanets. And there's actually, we estimate to be trillions of galaxies out there. So there's a lot of stars and a lot of exoplanets that we got to find. Mm -hmm. And so we need people like you to keep doing what you're doing. And it's one thing to get to this place where you know all this knowledge, but it's another thing to teach a knowledge. Yeah. So you were in kindergarten and you taught the fifth graders, right? Yeah. How did you like that? It was a big opportunity for me. I like taught all the planets. It was awesome. <laughs> How do you feel when we visit each other and we get to talk about space? It feels good. I learn from you a lot, like more than I could imagine. You're my favorite person to talk about space too. You know that? Yeah. And you're learning so much by yourself too that you're teaching me as well. And that's <laughs> cool. really cool. The more you learn, the more we realize the little things in life we take for granted are the very things that make life possible. So when I look up in the stars, I think about that. That is pretty cool. My hope is that you are always going to be doing and learning about the things that you love the most. You can do whatever you want, but in the future, I think you're going to go to Kepler 452b. I am an engineer at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. I work on the Mars Science Laboratory Curiosity rover. I am a systems engineer and I've been doing a lot of testing for the past few years on activities that use the robotic arm and we test them here on Earth in the Mars yard. I'm also training to be a rover driver and operate the robotic arm actually on Mars for the Curiosity rover.
In a typical day, I drive into work. I work at a NASA facility, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and we have a lot of wildlife, a lot of flowers. We're in the mountains there in Pasadena, California. We see deer. Sometimes there's been a bear on lab. That was a little scary. And then we go in and we first look at the data from Curiosity that it had acquired on the day before, on the Mars day, which is called the Sol, on the Sol before. Curiosity's typical day is that in her morning, she receives commands and instructions from Earth. Then she executes those. So she does all of the activities that we planned for her. She acquires a whole bunch of science data, images, things like that. Then that data gets sent back to Earth and then we, the engineers, as well as the scientists, look at that data and decide what Curiosity is going to do the next day. So the scientists are looking at from a point of view of what, where do they want to drive or what rocks do they want to explore in more detail. And the engineers were looking at to see if Curiosity is healthy and if all of the activities executed properly and then we're also contributing constraints to the science team. We're telling them how much power they have and those types of things and whether or not it's safe to, to do that. And then as a rover planner, uh, I either plan specifically the commands for the arm, how to place the robotic arm on things or how to sieve those samples and drop them off or also plan the driving. And that's really fun because we get to put on our 3D glasses and look at the rocks, look at all the terrain and say, oh, is this rock safe to drive over? Do I want to, when I stop and I'm about to place the drill on a rock, do I really want to be perched up like one wheel on a big rock? I probably don't. So those are the types of things we're looking at, putting on those 3D glasses and feeling like we're on Mars almost. When I was growing up, I didn't necessarily think that women could be engineers. I think everyone told me that women could be anything they wanted, but I never saw anyone that was a woman and was also an engineer until I went to college. And so I just want everyone to know that really it is for anyone. Anyone can do it. And don't listen to anyone in your school that's teasing you or telling you that things can't be the way you want them to be because if you put your mind to it, you can do whatever you want. Hi, my name is Mark from the San Antonio Museum of Science and Technology. Today, we're going to talk about rockets. What is a rocket? A rocket is an instrument that we use here to send things into space, such as like a satellite, maybe a rover, people. But what is a rocket exactly? Well, a rocket has four elements. One of them is going to be the nose. The next one is going to be the body. It's going to have some fins, and then it's going to have combustion. In order to build a rocket, you're going to need scissors, tape, a straw, pen or pencil, a ruler. Also, you're going to need a piece of paper, and you're going to draw a rectangle. It's going to have the measurements of one inch by four inch. And then you're going to have triangles. It doesn't matter how big is your triangle. You can make it smaller, you can make it bigger. You can have two, you can have three, or you can have four. That will help you for your fin. Now, we start cutting our rocket. Let's cut, cut the rectangle, and then the triangle. Now I finished cutting four triangles and one rectangle. It doesn't matter how many triangles you want. I choose four. Let's start building our rocket. The first thing you're going to need is your pencil to wrap it around your paper, kind of like a taco. Get your tape. Ah, the first part is done. Now, if you can do it by yourself, you can always ask someone to help you. You get the second piece of tape and wrap it around on the top. Now that I have done the bottom and the top, let's do one along size. What do you know? There goes my, my body. Now, the next thing I want to do is uh, do is fold the tip of my body. 
just like so. Grab some more tape. And there you go. Now you get tape. We use a straw because we want it to be smaller than the diameter that we use when we put it inside our rocket. To finalize this, we're gonna get our fins. And we're gonna attach them to the bottom of our rocket. So grab your tape. Grab your fin. The fins are gonna be important for us to have. Why? Because they're gonna help us to keep direction. And there you go. I have one done. Grab your fin again. And now I have two. Now that I have finished my rocket, let's test it. Shall we? I have a rocket and I have my straw. So you will put it inside. And when I test it first, zero degrees. I don't have a protector. How do I do that? Use your hand parallel to the ground. Ooh, let's see how far is that goes. This is my feet. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. Let's test it one more time. What about 45 angle degrees? 45, how do I measure that? Zero, 45. <laughs> this time change, let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Let's test it one more time, shall we? What about 90, 90 degrees? Let's see what happens. 90. One, two, three, four, five. So as you can see, we tested different angles and with different distances. How fun was that? You can make it shorter, you can make it longer, one fin, two fins, you the engineer, you decide. Have fun building your own rocket. Hi everyone, I'm Mr. Weinberger and I'm so glad to be here with you today. There was this old commercial about candy bars. This one candy bar has chocolate mixed with peanut butter. If you didn't know better, you might not think those two would go with each other, but once you've tasted them together, delicious. In the commercial, someone accidentally gets the chocolate and the peanut butter mixed together. They're disappointed at first, but when they taste the resulting mix, they experience sweet bliss. Today's lesson, is all about the chocolate and peanut butter of math. Our chocolate is division and our peanut butter is fractions. Those are two awesome treats by themselves, but when you mix the two, you get sweet bliss. To stick with today's theme, today's lesson is going to be all about cookies. Let's start this party by thinking about fractions. Take a fraction like one sixth. What is a sixth really? It's a whole divided into six parts, like this giant cookie I'm imagining. This cookie is so big, one person can't eat it all. You've got to divide it into six and let five other people share it. A sixth then is really just the whole divided into six parts. It's just one divided by six. Did that blow your mind? One sixth is another way to write one divided by six. In fact, all fractions, if you think about them this way, are just division problems. Think of a crazy fraction like 
two seventy-sevenths. That's just dividing something into seventy-seven parts and taking two of them, which is the same as two divided by seventy-seven. We might write this as a formula of sorts. A over B equals A divided by B. If our fraction is four sevenths, then we could write our formula as four sevenths equals four divided by seven. Two elevenths would be two divided by 11. Are fractions just division? Yes, they are. Well, what about those fractions greater than one? Yep, those are still just division problems. Take a fraction greater than one like 18 fifths. You can represent it as 18 wholes divided five ways, which is the same as 18 divided by five. Or think about our formula. A over B equals A divided by B. 18 fifths equals 18 divided by five. No matter what, you can think of fractions as top number divided by bottom number, or numerator divided by the denominator. Time to get some cookies involved. Imagine I have three friends, so there's three friends plus me, that's four of us. We're splitting a box of cookies. If there are 20 cookies in a box, how many cookies do we each get? We could represent this as a division problem. 20 divided by four equals some unknown quantity of cookies. We could set this up as a partial quotient problem, like this, with 20 inside the box and four on the outside of the box. We could draw 20 cookies then count them off for each person. Hey, we could even just open a box of cookies and count them out, and count them out, which sounds like the tastiest plan I've heard so far. Or we could represent this as a fraction. 20 divided by four is the same thing as 20 fourths. If we simplify that fraction, we get the answer, which in this case, is five. How did I simplify that in my head? I just asked myself, what times four equals 20? Five. Five times four equals 20. So let's make this just a little trickier. Imagine, instead of splitting one box of cookies with my friends, what if I split seven boxes of cookies? How many boxes of cookies will we each get? If I think of this as a division problem, I want to divide seven boxes by four people. Seven divided by four is the same as a fraction with a numerator of seven and a denominator of four. If I want to, I can stop there. Each of us gets seven fourths boxes of cookies. That's not very easy for me to picture in my mind, so I want to turn this into a mixed number. Seven fourths is the same thing as four fourths plus three fourths. So, seven fourths is one and three fourths. That's easier for my brain. If we split the seven boxes of cookies, each of us gets one whole, blo whole box plus three fourths of a box. Staying in the same line of thinking, what if we change our problem a little? Instead of seven boxes of cookies divided by four people, what if we did four boxes of cookies divided among seven people? How would we write that? If you said four divided by seven or four over seven, you're right. And there's your answer. Each person would get four-sevenths of a box of cookies. 
Let's picture what that would actually look like. Here's my box of cookies, like so. I'll divide it into sevenths. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven equal parts. Now, let's color in four of those, four sevenths. As you can see, if I divide my box of cookies in half, four sevenths is just a little more than half, so we're talking about a little more than half a box of cookies for each person. Let's wrap things up with one more problem. Imagine that I'm going to give these cookies to my class. I have 20 students in my class, and I have 32 cookies to give them. I have four jugs of juice to go with the cookies. So, I put my class into four groups. First, how many students are in each group? Then we want to know how many cookies will each group get? Finally, how many cookies will each student get? There's a lot of parts to this problem. So let's break it down step by step. First, let's set up the groups. We divide 20 by four to get 20 students in four groups. Let's represent that as a fraction, 20 fourths. If we're satisfied with that, there's my answer. Each group has 20 fourths students. I need an easier number to work with, but I know 20 fourths is the same as five. Each group has five students. Now, I'll figure out how many cookies per group. I take 32 cookies and divide by four groups. That's 32 fourths. Each group gets 32 fourths cookies. Four times eight is 32, so 32 fourths equals eight. Each group gets eight cookies. Four groups, eight cookies per group. The last part is knowing how many cookies per student. Eight cookies per group divided by five students per group. Each student then gets eight fifths cookies. That's the same as one and three-fifths. So each student gets one whole cookie and three-fifths of another cookie. We can check our math by drawing a model. Here are my eight cookies for the group. I can give a whole cookie to each group member like so. I'll divide the remaining cookies into five parts each. Now, when I want to give those out, each group member gets one-fifth of the first cookie, one-fifth of the second cookie, and one-fifth of the third cookie. That's a total of one whole cookie plus one, two, three-fifths. One and three-fifths. Sometimes drawing a picture really helps me understand the problem. Today we learned that division problems can be represented as fractions. The numerator is divided by the denominator. If you think of division problems as fractions, then often the answer is right there. My favorite fraction is that fraction of a cookie. amazing time exploring outer space with you. What did you think about Jessica's job as a NASA engineer? I loved it. Thanks for having me. Until next time. This program is made possible in part by Michigan Department of Education, the state of Michigan, and by viewers like you.